Welcome, everybody. Hi, my name is Kari Sautner. I'm coming from the National Constitution Center, and I'm going to be your host today. I'm the Chief Learning Officer there, and our class today is all about the Constitutional Convention. This is Constitution Week. We're super excited about it, and I'm super excited because Tom Donnelly, one of our top scholars, is here with me today. So Tom is going to walk us through the Constitutional Convention. It's going to be a half an hour class. We'll ask lots of questions. And we are starting off with our favorite person at the Constitutional Convention. So Tom, before we kick into the topic, could you share with everybody again, who's your favorite and why? Sure, so my favorite, and thank you, Curry. I'm, I'm Tom Donnelly. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Constitution Day is tomorrow, so it's good to have, good to pregame here uh, with, with talking about the Constitutional Convention. Uh, my favorite person at the convention was Pennsylvania's uh, James Wilson, who is you know, one of the forgotten founders, but was really one of the intellectual architects of many features of the Constitution, notably the presidency being one of them. But he himself was, you know, the most, um, most extraordinary advocate for America's commitment to popular sovereignty. So that being, again, we've talked about it a few different times in these classes, but that commitment to a government that is uh, driven by we the people. And so the preamble stating that and stating the, Wilson's deep constitutional vision of a government rooted in we the people always inspiring for me. I'm not going to discuss the rest of his bio, which is also a very sad and tragic bio, but we'll get to that probably <laughs> at, at another time. There's a lot to go through today, but yes, we encourage everybody to read up about the other people at the convention. You might remember like George Washington, but you might not know anything about J uh, Jonathan Dayton. So there's a lot of forgotten founders in that convention and they're all really interesting and they all played a big role. So Tom, we're gonna go through the Constitutional Convention today. Here are some of kind of like our big questions that we have for today's class. As we look at these, we look at like, why did the founding generation decide to write a constitution? How does the United States Constitution different from the Articles of Confederation? What were some of the main compromises reached by the delegates at the Constitutional Convention? But before we go into all of that, can you just set the field for us? When the heck did this happen? Why did they, like, here are my basic questions, like, why did they come to Philadelphia in the first place? Why did they come to Philadelphia? What was going on? Give us, like, kind of where in the timeline we are, and then what did they do when they were in Philadelphia in that long, hot, smelly, sweaty summer? So give us kind of, like, lay, lay of the land for us first. That's great, Curry. And I'll just start with some quick facts about the convention so we know exactly where we are, who was there, who wasn't there. Some interesting points like that. And then I'll walk through, get to walk sort of the, the road to the convention, and then we'll talk about the convention itself. So some, some quick facts. So when was the Constitutional Convention? 1787. It was between May and September. The Constitution itself was put together in roughly 100 working days. So the, the delegates really got a lot done in a very short period of time. And we'll talk about some of the compromises that they had to reach in Philadelphia. The convention, you know, as Curry said, met in Philadelphia in the Pennsylvania State House, which is now known as Independence Hall, which you can see right from the front of the National Constitution Center, which is one of the more inspiring things about our commute, Curry, when we get to go into the Constitution Center um, and work. The delegates were selected by their states, and the, and the delegates themselves voted by state, not by delegates. So the organizing power in the convention was by state. The president of the convention, nominated, uh, uh, elected by the convention, was George Washington. But there were noted founders who weren't there. Thomas Jefferson was in France. John Adams was in England. John Hancock was the governor of Massachusetts. And then key figures like Virginia's Patrick Henry, who was deeply skeptical of a strong national government, decided not to attend the National Convention, uh, the, the Constitutional Convention. You know, in the end, the Constitution's completed on September 17th, 1787. That's when the, 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 uh, the, the, the different delegates signed the Constitution. Three delegates didn't sign the Constitution. So that's Elbridge Gerry, George Mason, Edmund Randolph, um, and some other key delegates left before the end of the convention because they didn't like what was going into the Constitution. So Luther Martin of Maryland, an important figure, um, uh, decided to leave the convention. Um, and we'll, we'll discuss ratification next week, so how it is we approved of the Constitution. Uh, but rat it was ratified on June 21st, 1788, and the first Congress met on March 4th. 1789. Now, in terms of the big, big idea, the big takeaway, the thing to think about here as we're discussing the convention, you know, one is that, you know, the, the founding generation came together in Philadelphia to create a new government that was stronger than the government they had, the Articles of Confederation, but still limited. 
And so they were really trying to strike a balance between having a stronger national government, one that worked, one that could govern a truly great nation, which they thought America was destined to be, while also not abusing power, while not threatening our liberties. We didn't just and we didn't just fight a revolution, win a revolution to get rid of an abusive government, to put a new abusive government in place. And so that was very much on their mind. Now, I already said we had uh, you know, a government in place, the Articles of Confederation. Why was it that certain delegates thought that we needed a new constitution? Well, if we're thinking about the Articles of Confederation, what's the big takeaway there? It's that the Articles of Confederation were a very weak national government. It's, it's what they, they, quote, they were known as, quote, um, a league of friendship. So really a compact, almost more like the United States at that point in time under the Articles, more like the United Nations than the United States. We had 13 separate state governments. And if you think about these state governments in context, this was an exciting moment for those people who lived in those state governments. From the moment we declared independence, they would get to create their own constitutions, their own governments in the states. And for many of them, that's where the action was. But this provided a problem. We had this weak national government, the Articles of Confederation, that couldn't do the sorts of things that we thought that, that over time we have, we, we have thought that national governments should be able to do. So it didn't have the power to tax. It didn't have the power to regulate commerce, so business between the different states. It didn't have the power to raise an army. Um, you know, and, 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 and you know, you may think, well, those, those are some structural problems. If you're concerned about a strong government, yeah, you might not want a national government doing that. But the other part was they, they, they put in place an impossible amendment process in the Articles of Confederation, where it would require unanimous approval by the states to alter any of these powers, to, to learn from experience and alter the government in a way that made it stronger and better, even if not all dominant. And we know, like, when you think of the Articles of Confederation, just one state, Rhode Island, was not going to play ball. They didn't want a national government, period. And so unanimity was impossible. We couldn't even amend the Articles. And to do, to even exercise the powers the Articles had required a supermajority of the states, nine out of 12. And so we created a national government that was weak and frankly couldn't govern. And so, Curry, this created all sorts of problems. We, we end up seeing, you know, the, 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 um, the, the economy, you know, a, a couple, two things. I mean, one is that we run into economic problems. And so, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're, we, um, the various states end up uh, in all sorts, there's a debt crisis in the states. Um, the states themselves are putting up trade barriers against one another. And so you don't have sort of a free flow of commerce between the states. And so with this, the, the Articles of Confederation end up having, you know, no authority to coordinate the economy of the nation to, 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 to deal with the debt crisis that's happening in the states. And to really, you know, in the end, do much of anything that we think a national government should be doing. And again, remember, it's impossible to amend this thing. And so we're, we're, we're seeing this problem of these state governments trying to address these problems, you know, from the perspective of some of the nationalists, doing things that they thought were bad policy. So things like providing debt relief to debtors. So debtors are paying huge land taxes. They have no money. They can't pay their debts. They're being thrown in debtor's prison and they're demanding from their governments, governments that were very close to the people, do something about this. But you know, for, for some nationalists who are concerned about the long-term effects of this on the economy, they're concerned that this is bad economic policy and it's gonna to continue to drive us into an economic crisis. Um, of course, Curry, I'll end with Shay's Rebellion, which is really the most- And I was gonna say, this yeah. is the part that I want you to really like, because I don't think I ever learned this clearly. And some of our students, you get to learn it for real this time and the right way. We, we were a bunch of friends working together. Unanimous vote, I can't even imagine that. Just to like hit that one more time, Tom. The fact that everybody had to agree on something to change it. So to tax people, to raise money, to pay for what the government was doing, everybody had to vote unanimously. I can't even get my family to vote on which type of pizza we're going to get for dinner. I can't imagine everybody agreeing to vote on taxes. So that's what I want to talk about. Shay's Rebellion. And how close were we? You know, we won. This is after the revolution. We are living under the Articles Confederation. We are a a loose league of friendship, um, like different countries working together. How close were we to losing it all? Like how close were we to brink of falling apart and not being a country? I mean, on knife's edge for some of these moments, because again, America as a union 
wasn't inevitable. One could imagine just having, we could have been Europe. It could have just been a series of small states, small independent states, and we don't, there's no inevitability that we have to come together as a union. Um, and you know, and, and so Chase Rebellion, here, here we go. And this, this ends up being a key moment. So they're, they're already, so this is 1786. The, the, you know, the economy, the economic situation grew dire in America. Many of those things I just talk, talked about are plaguing Western rural Massachusetts. Uh, that's a great picture, Curry. I don't think I've seen that one of, of, of Chase Rebellion Google. there. Yeah, like no, Google. And, 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 and so, you know, in the end, we're, 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 the, the Articles of Confederation, again, could do nothing to address the debt that many of the, of, of the Americans are facing, of the high land taxes that they're facing. And so this enter Shays Rebellion here in late 1786. So who's Daniel Shays? So Daniel Shays, he's a 39 year old farmer. He fought in the American Revolution. He fought in Lexington. He fought at Bunker Hill and he's organizing a bunch of farmers uh, to, to create in effect an armed fighting force that's gonna march through the Western part of the state. And what are they demanding though? They're demanding a Republican, small R Republican government that responds to their needs. There's a serious policy problem. We don't have money. We have a lot of debt. We have to pay, we have to pay big taxes. You're seizing our farms. You're throwing some of us in debtor's prison. Hear us, you in Boston, you the economic and governing class of Boston, the state government of Massachusetts, you are not hearing us. What did we, what did I, Daniel Shays, fight for if not for you to listen to me? And who are these farmers? Many of them are former soldiers turned farmers and they wanted debt relief from the states. They wanted the state government to hear them. And so they are armed. They're you know, marching through Western Massachusetts. They're seizing control of court buildings. So they're preventing the state government and the courts from seizing their farms. They're forcing debtors prisons to close. And they're, they're, they're looking to eventually commandeer the arsenal at Springfield, Massachusetts because they wanna arm themselves more fully, bring more people on board and they wanna to march to Boston. And they want to demand that that state government hears what they have to say. Now, what can the Articles of Confederation do in the face of this? Really nothing. I mean, the Articles, Articles of Confederation, they can ask the states for help, but they can't force the states to send them troops. So what's the solution here? It ends up being a Massachusetts militia armed against Shays rebels. I think roughly, you know, a few hundred and a few hundred on each side clashing. Um, and it's, it's, the, it's the state militia, it's the Massachusetts militia that puts down this rebellion. Now what, if you're a nationalist, if you're George Washington, James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, you're looking at this and you're saying, what in the, on the one hand, what in the world is going on? And you're wondering, is this just the beginning of more widespread violence? Violence that we can do nothing to respond to? The flip side being, for, think of George Washington's perspective. Washington had to lead troops under the Articles of Confederation. And he knows, he knows how much the Articles struggled to raise money for his troops. He knows how much the the, the Articles of Confederation struggled for money to pay his soldiers. He knows the feeling of, of indignity and of indignation that the soldiers were feeling and the threat of, of mutiny and rebellion among the soldiers of, on his own watch. And so this was personal for someone like Washington, personal for Alexander Hamilton, who again, fought in the Revolutionary War. And so what happens? We see these nationalist leaders come together and say, we need to call a new convention. We need a stronger government. May, you know, in, in some of their heads, maybe it's revising the articles in a certain way, but maybe it's putting in place a new government. And so on February 21st, 1787, the Confederation Congress agreed to call a convention of state delegates to meet in Philadelphia to quote, for the quote, sole and express purpose of revising the articles. And as we know, some delegates had, uh, had different ideas, Curry. Yeah, and this is the part that I love because it's, it's very different than the way we kind of romanticize this moment you know, they come to the convention and some of them are like, oh, we're not going to fix it. We're going to take it and throw it out. And so talk about a revolution. They took the governing document at the time and threw it out and started from scratch. Now, a couple of things around this. I want to kind of walk through who's in the room, who's not in the room. And what, talk about George Washington for a minute and the weight of George showing up. Because a lot of these players are important people. But they're not, you know, you don't see Patrick Henry in the room. You don't see John Jay in the room. You don't see um, uh, John Hancock in the room. Why are we seeing people like Madison and Governor and Hamilton? Why it feels a little different than the revolution. So can you kind of give me a lay of the land of who's in the room, who showed up? And I know by May 25th, there was a quorum. So they had enough people to officially start it. But what kind of got that energy around it? And then also, 
who didn't even show up at all, who was out from the get-go. Absolutely. And so let's just start with, with Washington. And, and I saw also someone's, you know, we had at least some votes for Benjamin Franklin at the beginning here as your favorite person at the convention. And so what's significant about the two of them being there? Well, they are the continental, the national figures in the United States of America. And so, you know, even, you know, let's put it this way, even if you may not have wanted a strong national government, critic, people who were critics of a strong national government still thought the articles had serious problems. And so regardless, across a wide range of people, there was a sense that we needed to do something about the Articles of Confederation. But people really, you know, at this point, we had some failed conventions already. We had the Annapolis Convention, which preceded the Constitutional Convention, where we were calling together delegates to start thinking about possible reforms to the Articles, and very, very few people show up. Um, and so like, there's a sense in which we have, we're calling for this convention in Philadelphia, and we're wondering, what is it going to be like? Well, having Washington and Franklin there suggested to everyone, this is something serious. If people like that will come here and sit through and debate and talk about what needs to happen to our government, this is a serious convention, a serious meeting. And for Washington, it took some convincing to get him to come to the convention. He had a ton to lose. He was, he was the most famous and beloved figure in the United States of America. He thought he retired from public service in 1783. And it would take especially the cajoling of, of James Madison to say, no, 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 there's, there's serious problems here. You need to be there because it, you, know, you are the one sort of unifying figure that can, can bring dignity to the proceedings and make sure that they succeed. And so Washington ends up being absolutely pivotal, but don't forget about Franklin. He is a very, he's, he's an internationally famous figure, a beloved American. The two of them there tell people, constitutional convention, take it seriously. Now who's not there? Well, someone like, let's say Patrick Henry of give me liberty or give me death, Virginia, um, you know, one of the key figures of the revolution, um, qu quite like the state power that Virginia had under the Articles of Confederation, was skeptical of a strong national government, was afraid that a strong national government would effectively squelch the powers of the states. And so he doesn't show up. Richard Henry Lee doesn't show up. There are, there are a bunch of people who are skeptics of a stronger national government who decide not to go to the convention. Now their argument, I'm sure in their heads is, we're not going to, if, if we go to the convention, we will be giving it a certain amount of legitimacy. We are not going to give it legitimacy. But the flip side being, if the critics of national government aren't at the convention, those voices aren't heard in as forceful a way as they would be otherwise. There are skeptics of national power at the, at the convention, to be sure. Um, but you know, not as many as there could have been, and perhaps not as strong a voice or as respected a voice as Patrick Henry. And so that's the calculation. Um, and it's interesting because you have sort of you, you have sort of like those older revolutionaries like Henry and Washington, then you have the younger generation of James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, et cetera, who again sort of saw the Articles of Confederation up close and how they failed. And, want, and, and but also believed in America's destiny, a destiny that they were going to be the ones to lead us towards, and they wanted a better government. Yeah, and and Rhode Island doesn't even show up. And and why does Rhode Island? I mean, like you guys take guesses in the chat box. Why do you think a state like Rhode okay. Island, in living under the Articles of Confederation, where everybody has an equal voice, why do you think Rhode Island wouldn't show up? And good job, guys. They found it's like. We're playing Where's Waldo right now as you talk at the same time. Everybody's finding Franklin in that's like a powder blue outfit he's got going on. And yeah, right. Washington. Yeah, and Washington's standing on the red carpet. That's his famous, the famous rising sun chair there as well. So it's fun to decode uh, paintings as well as decoding documents. Um, so a little bit about why Rhode Island doesn't show up. Any guesses in the chat box? Why? What is it about Rhode Island? It's tiny. Nice job. Smaller exactly. population. Yes, that's right. Very good. Smart, smart, smart crew in the chat box. Um, so they get there, Tom. They're there. It's small. Rhode Island doesn't even show up. They begin to rewrite it. What do they actually come up with? This is a really important part about the convention. What did they, at the end of the convention on September 17th, what do they come up with and what are their first actions as a group, I should say, after September 17th? Sure. So one thing to note about what they accomplished on September 17th is what they accomplished is a mere proposal to the American people. The thing to remember about the Constitution then that's created at the convention is that they're proposing this to the American people. And it, it, it's in the end, the American people through ratifying conventions in the states that can say yay or nay, yes or no. And that is a, that's the core of what we talk about, rule of we the people. That's what it meant. You have the power to abolish or alter your government as you'd like. And, and so like they took that very seriously. I just want to bracket that because 
We need to think about the convention as an important moment, obviously, but we shouldn't forget about the role of the American people in the ratifying conventions and the role of popular sovereignty. So sort of put that to the side. Um, what ends up in the Constitution? Well, one, we have, you know, let's just walk through it quickly, Curry. We have, the, it begins with a preamble, we the people, again, popular sovereignty. Then it has three articles, articles one, two, and three, which lay out the structures of the national government with article one, giving us Congress, the legislative branch, which is tasked with making the laws. Article two, giving us the executive branch led by a single president that's responsible for enforcing the laws. And article three outlines the judicial branch with the Supreme Court at its, at its head, and that branch is going to interpret the law. So we get right there through articles one, two, and three, the separation of powers, the, the, the legislative, executive, and judicial power in three separate branches. If we look at the rest of the Constitution, it deals with a range of other issues. You know, Article four tells us the relationship between the various states and the states and, and, and their citizens. You know, if we look at Article five, we get an amendment process. So it's an amendment process that's easier than the original Articles of Confederation. Um, and so with that, they, they lay out a way for us to alter the Constitution over time. With Article six, we, we establish the, the, the superiority of national law over state law. And then Article seven, we set out the process for ratifying the Constitution, which unlike the articles which require unanimity to amend, the, uh, the, 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 the Constitution would go into effect if nine, uh, if, if, if nine states nine out of 13 approve of it. And so that's, that's a whirlwind tour of, of what they set down in 1787, that basic structure of our government. So we like to call that the structural constitution. So, so many times when you ask like anybody in the world, like ask your parents or like from, when you say, what do you think about the constitution? Almost all the time what they say is something that's in an amendment. Um, sometimes you'll hear things like, oh, Supreme Court or president, or Congress, that's structural constitution. So on September 17th, when they're giving it back to the people for ratification, it's that foundational part of the government. Tom, I always like to say that it's like the rules of the game board for the United States government, like how it works. Here's your job, Article One, Congress. Here's your job, Article Two, President. Here's your job, Article Three, um, Supreme Court and the court. Here's how it works. This is what you're in charge of, and this is how you have to play together. But that's the part in September 17th that was being back to the people. Now, one of the they had a lot of debates. It wasn't easy. It didn't. It you know it's not, they did it fast, but it was still a long, hot, sweaty summer. Um, sure, kind of smelly because they're all in wool, and Philadelphia is not known for comfortable summers. But oh. they had a lot of discussions, debates, and a lot of compromises. And I think one of the things about Rhode Island that we need to really clear up, like why did Rhode Island not show up comes in and through some of these compromises. So can you kind of walk us through the big compromises and the effects that they had on the way our country kind of played out after this? Absolutely. So we have about seven minutes by now, Mike on here. So maybe I'll take the first two bullets relatively quickly and then we can talk. The last two have to do with the debate over slavery. It's a heavy topic and one that obviously is of great interest historically, but also to us today. And so maybe we'll take a little bit more time on those. Does that sound good? That sounds great. And I do have an awesome question in the chat box. So we'll add that to the end to save a couple minutes. <laughs> okay, perfect. Okay, so the first two compromises, the Connecticut or Great Compromise and the Electoral College. Um, you know, the first has to do with how we're going to, to uh, structure Congress. And the second has to do with how we're going to select a president. So the Connecticut or Great Compromise, name the Connecticut Compromise because the main, you know, the main figure here is Connecticut's Roger Sherman, which I, I can't resist this quote. So, so Rufus King was a Massachusetts delegate. One of his friends is warning him, there's this guy, Roger Sherman, that's gonna be at the convention. You should really, you should be a little worried about him. And here's how, here's the description. They describe Sherman was, quote, cunning as the devil. And if you attack him, you ought to know him well. He is not easily managed, but if he suspects you are trying to take him in, you may as well catch an eel by the tail. And so Roger Sherman is his figure, we don't talk about very much today, but he spoke more than nearly anyone else at the convention and he led the Connecticut Compromise. And so what is that? What did we, what did we come, come with? Well, there are two competing proposals as to how we're going to um, structure Congress and the debates are over representation. So it's a debate between large states and small states largely. The large states coalesce around something known as the Virginia Plan, which is James Madison's brainchild. And basically what it says is the national legislature should be two houses both of them organized around population. 
So both of the houses of Congress, if you're a larger state, you get more members of Congress. That's the principle. If you're a large state like Virginia, large state like Pennsylvania, James Wilson, also a supporter of this, you could see why you would want that. You have more representatives in Congress. That's the Virginia plan. The small states you might suspect said, no, we don't think that's a great idea. And so we have William Patterson of New Jersey coming in with the New Jersey plan, which basically just tries to keep in place this power structure in the legislature that we have in the Articles of Confederation. So every state gets the same representation, equal representation in Congress. And so they, you have these two sides battling out large state Virginia plan population, small state New Jersey plan, equal representation. And Roger Sherman, who's on the left there, and Oliver Ellsworth come in, these two men from Connecticut, and say, let's compromise. So what's the compromise? Well, the US House of Representatives, Madison, Virginia plan, you can have what you want in the US House. The United States House of Representatives will be organized by population. Again, that means if you're a larger state, you have more members of Congress. That's the US House. And then we'll have a Senate. And the Senate will be organized, as with the New Jersey plan, around equal state representation. Every state, no matter its size, whether you're Rhode Island in teeny tiny and not even at the convention, or big bad Virginia, you'll have two senators. And so we end up with this compromise. Again, the thing to note, the last thing I'll say about this compromise, and this is about the structure of political power in Congress, which everyone thought would be the most powerful branch of government. So it's a really, really, the stakes couldn't be higher. It ends up coming down to the vote of a single state. So it's on knife's edge. It's not as though everyone came around and said, oh, this is a great idea. Let's all coalesce and all vote for it. Madison, Wilson, supporters of the Virginia plan were outraged that you would have a Senate with equal state representation. It violated everything they believed about popular sovereignty and representation. They would later defend the Senate when arguing for the ratification of the Constitution, but the stakes were high, you know, and, and the debate was contentious. And so that's the Connecticut Compromise. So two things really quickly on that. That's why Rhode Island doesn't want to go in the first place, because it feels like it's going to lose power. Imagine if it was only by population, and you guys said it earlier, it's so small, it wouldn't have an equally small voice. It was only by population. But I also wanted to just remind everybody how big Virginia was back then. So it was Virginia and West Virginia were one big area. So it was a massive, massive plot of land and a large population, just to kind of reframe the sizes of things mm -hmm. at that time. Okay, next one, as we fly through this, um, and I, there are some good questions coming in in the chat, so we'll save some time at the end. So we'll skip through the Federalist Papers, but let's, are we going to do, do the president? Let's, let's take like college. 45 seconds. The Electoral College deserves more than 45 seconds. We're going to do the Electoral College later later uh, in, in the fall. So we'll talk about it in more detail. So what, the Electoral College is how we select the president. Um, and so, you know, what is the Electoral College? Well, rather than on election day electing directly for who the president is through your popular vote, um, you end up electing the electors that then meet and select the president. Sort of confusing, but there is actually this body, the Electoral College, that meets in December each year and casts a ballot for president. If someone secures um, and a majority of the Electoral College, they become the president. Even if they lose the popular vote nationwide, they become the president. Importantly, also, if there is no majority in the Electoral College, the election then goes to the House of Representatives. With the with the members with the uh, with the members voting by state in the House of Representatives, and so here, how do we get the number of electors? Well, it's connected to the number of members of Congress that you have. So if you have two members in the U.S. House of Representatives, two senators, your state gets four electors. And the way it works in almost every state today is, if you win the popular vote of that state, even by a single vote, you receive all of the electors from that state. So that's how the structure works. Why did we end up with the Electoral College rather than something else? Well, to simplify quite a bit, the Electoral College wound up being a compromise between people like James Wilson, James Madison, Gouverneur Morris, who wanted the direct popular election of the president. So they really just wanted whoever wins the national vote becomes president. There were some delegates who wanted that. It's a, it's a compromise between them and many, many, many delegates who wanted Congress to select the president. And so as you could already, as you could already see with how I explained the Electoral College at the beginning, for someone like Wilson who supports direct popular election, he thinks the Electoral College is the best that he can do. And that over time, they leave, we leave the question of who decides the electors to the state legislatures. And his prediction, which is right, is that state legislatures are eventually going to place the decision of who these electors are in the hands of the American people, making it a po quite popular election. So that's for Wilson, direct popular election. That's why you want the Electoral College. For those who support a congressional election, they thought that after George Washington, basically no figure was going to be able to get a majority in the Electoral College. And so that most elections, as James, as uh, George Mason said, 19 elections out of 20 for the presidency are going to go to the U.S. House of Representatives. 
They thought that the Electoral College would effectively be congressional election by other means. And so the Electoral College ends up being a compromise between those two visions. And we will have class on October, the week of October 12th, all about uh, October 5th is Electoral College and the presidency is October 12th. So we'll dive deeper into these topics in October, which is like election month. Now, um, let's dive into the three-fifth compromise and the slave trade, Tom. Yeah, no, this, so, so this is obviously the, 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 the tragic part of the convention, the compromises that the convention made over slavery. Now there are two, you know, one, you know, just to put, put the, the, the stats out there, I mean, 25 of the 55 convention delegates held enslaved people and slavery was critical to many of these delegates' wealth and the economies in their states. And so at the convention, the framers, on the one hand, anti-slavery delegates, and there were anti-slavery delegates, refused to recognize what they called the, the right to property in men in the constitution. So they don't mention slavery. They don't provide it with any direct, um, there's no you know, direct right to slavery in the constitution, which certainly some slaveholders in the South would want in there, some recognition explicitly of their property. The flip side being that the slaveholding delegates fought hard for structural protections of slavery in the structural constitution. And we're gonna talk about two of them right now briefly. You know, the most important probably is what's known as the three-fifths compromise or the three-fifths clause. And so as we discussed earlier, the U.S. House of Representatives draws districts based on a state's population. The larger the state, the more members of the House you get. And so the two sides, you know, the, the people in the slaveholding states and anti-slavery delegates fought over how are we going to count enslaved people for purposes of the congressional representation. The slaveholding delegates said five-fifths and the anti-slavery delegates said effectively zero fifths. And so the question, you know, it, it, in the end, I, I want to read, I want to read this quote from Governor Morris to give you a sense of there, there was, there were moments at the convention, there weren't many of them, but a few days where you have the anti-slavery delegates really attacking slavery to its core. And here's Governor Morris, he described, again, Pennsylvania delegate Governor Morris, one of the strongest anti-slavery voices at the convention, he referred to slavery as a quote, nefarious institution, the curse of heaven, on the states where it prevailed. And he attacked the three-fifths clause for giving, quote, the inhabitant of Georgia and South Carolina who goes to the coast of Africa and in defiance of the most sacred laws of humanity, tears away his fellow creatures from their dearest connections and damns them to the most cruel bondages. Uh, they shall have more votes in a government instituted for the protection of the rights of mankind than the citizen of Pennsylvania or New Jersey who views with a laudable horror so, ne no, so nefarious a practice. And so Governor Morris is really saying, and he says it, he says, you know, if, if, if in the end enslaved people are, are, are men, then make them citizens and let them vote. If they're property, we don't protect any other property in the constitution. We don't, we, we, we don't in the end say, you know, you have more expensive houses in Philadelphia, so you have more members of Congress. We don't do it that way. And so it should be zero fifths. In the end, the compromise that's, that's forged is again by Roger Sherman of Connecticut. Who, who says no to the slaveholders who say it should be five, they, that enslaved people should count as five fifths of a person and no to the anti-slavery voices who say it should be zero fifths. And instead grant three, say, say that enslaved people are three fifths of a per person for purposes of congressional uh, representation. Why is this important? Because it's going to boost the number of representatives in Congress that the slaveholding states get. Um, and this redounds the advantage in every, every branch of government. Cause so it's going to increase their power in the US House of Representatives, which in turn is going to increase their power in the electoral college because the number of electors is tied to the number of members of Congress you get, which in turn is going to increase their power at the Supreme Court because the Supreme Court is put in place, the members of the Supreme Court are appointed by presidents, many of whom will be pro-slavery. And so this is a really, you know, again, you know, for the, for Northern states and even for some of the anti-slavery delegates, they, they, they feared that the slaveholding states would simply leave the convention without protections like this, uh, but it ends up having a huge consequence over time. Yeah, and I think, you know, when we look at the constitution and we look at our past, you know, some people, we either try to like vilify it or heroify it. And what you really see in this is some great amazing moments and some horrible tragedies. So we're looking at the Sirius Compromise embedded into the constitution that people refuse to put the word slavery in the constitution, but they embed the power of the slaveholding states to hold on to it longer with the three-fifths compromise and it spreads across the entire government. So we, again, we're gonna dive and unpack this even more in October and November, but we wanna look at these main compromises and how they changed and affected the way our country moved from there. 
so we can really see the whole picture and all of the history, some that we love and some that we hate. Now there's one more, again, the word slavery is not in the document and the idea that meant there could be no property and man is not in there, but there's also things that help hold on to slavery. Um, and can we talk a little bit about the, the end of the slave trade sounds like it would stop it, but it, it does something different. It kind, of, it kind of counteracts it. So can you talk a little bit about um, the slave trade clause as well? Sure. So, I mean, yeah, the last compromise is over, you know, what power Congress might have to end the international slave trade. And so, you know, by this point in time, so at the convention 1787, even many slaveholding delegates abhor the international slave trade, which is seen as inhumane and dangerous. And it, it may feel, it may seem like odd to us to think, how can you hold slaves but then be a critic of the international slave trade? But that for at least some of the delegates, that was you know, very much their view. And it really was deep South states like South Carolina and Georgia, who, who effectively said, if you don't protect our, our, our right to continue to bring in enslaved people from Africa through the international slave trade, we're going to leave the convention. And so there's a really contentious battle over what sort of power Congress might have over the international slave trade. Initially, the, the, the delegates give Congress no power. Then they flip in the other direction and say, no, Congress will have the power to end the international slave trade in 1800 which Madison liked because he thought it was the beginning of a new century and a new America. Um, but then eventually the Deep South delegates fight and fight and fight and set that date at 1808. So, at, at eight, so before 1808, states can continue to import enslaved people from Africa. At 1808, Congress then has the power, January, for January 1st, 1808, to abolish the international slave trade. And Congress does that. I mean, as soon as they can in 1808, Congress abolishes the international slave trade. But what happened in the meantime between 1787 in 1808, well, we end up importing 200,000 enslaved people, which is almost as many enslaved people as we had imported into the United States total from the beginning of America to that point. So you really are talking about a massive number of people being brought in in that window. Um, I, there's a quote from Luther Martin I'm gonna say before I answer your last question there, Curry, about what happens after this. Luther Martin attacked the slave trade as, quote, inconsistent with the principles of the revolution and dishonorable to the American character Whereas deep Southern delegates like John Rutledge of South Carolina said, if you think we're gonna give away our power to bring in enslaved people from Africa and become part of this union, you're crazy. And so in the end, the delegates found a compromise empowering Congress to get rid of the international slave trade in 1808. But by then there are so many enslaved people in the United States that instead we have an internal slave trade that continues thereafter. And so, you know, there are some delegates certainly at the convention who think slavery in a generation or two is going to fizzle out. This is not the future of America, and it's going to, especially once we get rid of the international slave trade, it's going to 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 die. Basically, that prediction was quite wrong. Quite wrong. Yeah, and it, and you guys can look and kind of unpack and dig into why. Why did you know many of them thought it was starting to peter off, and that they were going back towards this idea of all men are created equal, and then the exact opposite happened. So dig in and really think about why, and we'll circle back on that when we talk about slavery in the Constitution. We have two real quick wrap up questions. And if you guys have to jump, we totally understand. But they were great questions. So Myla asked, what's the difference between ratification and an amendment? So, and that was a great question. Oh, um, yeah. So I want to do that really quickly. And then AJ has one other question. Okay, so ratification amendment, both rooted in popular sovereignty, sovereignty so people altering their government. A ratification is that single act where state by state, we decide whether yay or nay, yes or no, on a new constitution. It's that adoption moment, that founding moment when we vote the constitution up or down by state. So it's a singular moment. That's ratification. An amendment is the ongoing process where we can take that document and then change it over time. And so there's a formal process written into the constitution for doing that. Generally, it's two thirds of each house of Congress and then three fourths of the states for any amendment. And we've amended the constitution 27 times, including the Bill of Rights, including to abolish slavery, including to write equality into the constitution with the 14th amendment, including women's suffrage uh, with the 19th amendment. So that's that. And I always remember amendments have to be ratified or can be ratified. Yes. So, like they, yeah. <laughs> uh, and real quick, AJ, uh, when we were talking about the presidency, just wanted a clarification of what's the difference between an executive order and a law? Good question. <laughs> That's a great question. So, so an executive, so if we're thinking about, so where do executive orders come from? Generally speaking, it's the executive enforcing a law, carrying out a law that's passed by Congress. And so what you're looking at if you're the president is do I have 
authority under a law passed by Congress to do something and the executive order is then ordering the executive branch to do something based on that previous law that exists. I mean, that's the simplest way in which I can put it. I think that's awesome. And we're gonna dive into the executive branch in October um, really deeply so we can really unpack all of that. Um, thank you, Tom. This is such a fun class. It is a great week. If you guys want to join us tomorrow, uh, Justice Neil Gorsuch is going to join us at noon Eastern time, Alexis Co. on Friday. And then next week, we're going to talk all about ratification. So if you really want to know what okay. ratification is, join us. So thank you guys very much. Have a great day. Um, and bye. <laughs> See Thanks, you everyone. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording. Stop.